Okay, so in the first part of this uh, uh, practical side of uh, uh, regression, we'll cover the difference between lasso and reach regression. Uh, so we'll skip it through quickly with a very small data set, uh, UCI uh, Boston house prices. And so we'll actually build uh, some models from scratch uh, with uh, another more interesting task. <coughs> okay, so here we, uh, we have uh, a regression problem, so predicting a, a price for uh, in Boston house prices. Uh, so actually an instance here, as far as I remember, is the whole region of Boston. And uh, the target is a median price of houses in this region. And some, some features are uh, demographic. Uh, uh, yeah, so somehow crime rate is measured for, uh, for these regions. Uh, proportion of residential land uh, uh, so, uh, accessibility of uh, highways. So some features concerning infrastructure as well as uh, demographic like the percentage of people of lower status in terms of salary, I would say, uh, pupil to teacher ratio, and so on. So just uh, a dozen of features, I think 13 or so. Okay, it's really well known. Oh, you can uh, actually, you can find the description in the very same object that you uh, load from sklearn, this load Boston. The des description is right here. Uh, and, and so we'll just take a look at the difference between uh, less so and rich regression. <coughs> so less so will take this MSE, again, it's written here. Uh, whether you put one half here or not, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, so when you take derivatives, you've got a multiplied by two. Yeah, and I, I think I forgot about this in the theoretical part. Yeah, uh, so when you take a derivative, the two will go here and it will uh, be multiplied by one half. Uh, okay, you can add this or not, it doesn't matter too much. And uh, lesser regression is adding this regularization uh, when you sum all the absolute values of all your coefficients. So in uh, sklearn, this, this will be uh, less so from sklearn linear models. So if we go back here to imports uh, from linear model, uh, we are importing less so, ridge, and uh, CV here stands for cross-validation. So cross-validation can be performed a bit more efficient for, for linear models. And remember, logistic regression lives in the very same module, uh, linear, linear model. <coughs> okay, so alpha here is a hyperparameter, so we can uh, set it to some value, or we'll further tune it via cross-validation. And when we feed it to our data, we can notice that uh, sum of coefficients become exactly zero. And if we increase alpha, uh, let's say 10, so much more coefficients will be exactly zero. We can keep track of these features which were not useful for the model. So the first one which became zero was actually um, nit nitric oxides concentration. So the model just thought it's not an important feature. Uh, remember, with random forest, we also had feature importance. You can compare uh, what a linear model thinks is, imp is important, uh, what a forest thinks is a nice feature. Uh, there are no any theoretical foundations why linear models and random forest shall think the same, shall rank these features the same. This might be different, uh, but still it's a nice insight into, into the model. <coughs> Okay, and so uh, if you increase uh, regularization, you can find uh, all other features that uh, with non-zero weights. So these are important for the model. And in this way, actually, less so model selects uh, features. We can build such a plot. Uh, if we uh, change uh, this regularization parameter alpha, uh, we can keep track of all the weights. So with all these different colors, we depict weights for each of the features. And uh, you see at some point they just shrink to zero. Yeah, so here we start, yeah, so typically it's depicted with inverse axis. Uh, so here to the right we've got uh, low values of regularization. It 
uh, it uh, stands for high modal complexity. And here to the left, uh, regularization is increased. That means a modal complexity is lower. So typically you build some plots uh, for modal complexity. That's why values of uh, regularization are inversed here. And you see uh, coefficients, are almost all of them shrink to zero, but some, some of them don't. And you can actually get some insight from that, what uh, features actually your, your model uses. Mm. Well, for uh, less and rich, uh, you'd better use special cross-validation uh, methods and special classes in sklearn for that, less so CV. Uh, so uh, there are some uh, hyperparameter optimization procedures that are implemented uh, more, uh, more efficiently for, for linear models. And uh, so if you are really interested in it, one of the classic books about uh, machine learning, and I would say it's mostly from statistical perspective, um, Hasti and Tip Shirani, I think they're from Stanford, uh, the elements of statistical learning. So this is one of the classic books. Uh, these guys are statisticians in their past, so I would say it's machine learning from statistical perspective. And they study linear models very, very uh, carefully in depth. Uh, and so these methods are covered uh, actually in this book. Okay, so one of uh, these optimization procedures uh, uses a lot of this linear nature of, uh, of optimization to actually at the same time tune hyperparameters. Okay, just uh, in terms of an API, uh, this means that uh, tuning hyperparameters is much uh, quicker uh, for linear models uh, than in case of using just grid search CV. Okay, and so uh, when we fit it, just as a uh, lesser object as well, just fit x and y, we've got coefficients and we've got an optimal regularization coefficient alpha. Alpha with underscore. Uh, so this is the best one in terms of uh, mean squared error. Okay, you can actually assess uh, Crossval score. So if you don't like to tune uh, anything, uh, you'll call Crossval score as, as usual. SQLearn is uh, has some non not convenient, not really crystal clear uh, property. Is that uh, in SQLearn, in such objects like grid search CV, you typically maximize metrics like accuracy or F1 score or anything. So I think it's actually a disadvantage uh, that SQLearn can only maximize. But uh, instead, mean squared errors shall be minimized, and they they have some ugly workaround uh, for that. The scoring is actually negative mean squared error, so if it's negative, it is maximized, and that's why Crossval score returns negative values. Yeah, I don't know why they don't fix it. Uh, maybe it's impossible, but it's not at all convenient. So you to assess uh, your mean squared error via cross validation, you would perform Crossval score with this neg negative mean squared error scoring. And then you just calculate mean and take absolute values to actually get uh, mean squared error via cross-validation. Okay, and we see that if we do so, we've got some values of uh, mean, uh, mean squared error. And uh, okay, here for comparison, if we don't tune hyperparameters, we've got some higher value. Uh, well, so here we used uh, this optimal value uh, defined by cross-validation. Okay, we can depict uh, these validation curves. Uh, just a random value here. If we, uh, okay, I don't, I, I, yeah, okay, I don't remember why this exact value here. Uh, I think just if we uh, use some another value of regularization, we'll have higher. Uh, mean squared error. But this one, uh, Lasso CV tuned it and mean squared error is, uh, is lower in this case. Mm. Okay, so this uh, picture depicts the, actually, it's a validation curve. So depending on the value of regularization, uh, mean squared error, and we see optimum somewhere here is in a region of low values of regularization. 
Rich regression is uh, almost the same, but we uh, sum squares of these coefficients. And this results in uh, uh, <coughs> different values of regularization. And uh, coefficients are not zero uh, at all. So you, you might encounter some small values of coefficients, but they are not exactly zeros. <coughs> so I would say uh, in higher dimensions, uh, you would uh, prefer lasso regression, but it might be slower. So uh, for rich regression, uh, you've got analytical solution and uh, also uh, you, can, you can come up to nicer optimization procedures in case of uh, rich regression. But I would say typically if you, if, if you would like to choose features with your model, you'll go for uh, uh, lasso regression. Okay, but I will show actually a sklearn API for these linear models in a practical task. <coughs> yep, so I've got a template for that. Okay. Okay, actually I intended to delete all of this and write it live. <coughs> okay, some, uh, we've got some data set <coughs> and we're going to predict uh, customer uh, lifetime value. So just a few words about that. Uh, we'll take a look at the columns and I'll explain uh, the task. So we will have some, uh, some IDs. We are not currently interested in that. Uh, just some IDs of a customer and we have uh, the target feature will be here to the right. Uh, <coughs> LTV uh, stands for lifetime value. So actually how much we get from a client and we can measure it for one day after installation, uh, two days after installation and so on until 90 days after installation. Okay, so the task is actually <coughs> uh, keeping track of, a customer, of, of customers' uh, payments. Uh, one moment. <coughs> so I'll draw a time axis. And at some day, uh, I would say some T, T0, this will be a day, uh, we'll have a customer installing our application. So this will be installation. <coughs> and we're going to keep track of customer payments during some period. The lower, the better for us in terms of a business task. Uh, but uh, the longer we keep track, the better will be our prediction. So we are keeping track of, uh, uh, I would say seven days. So tomorrow will be T1, then T2, and then till the seventh day. So we are keeping track of customer payments during this period. Uh, so all these payments in the application, if it's a game, you can buy something, you can achieve some level and all these artifacts, you know. And then you, we are going to make a prediction for, again, in a business task, uh, if we are able to, to do a prediction for a year, it, it's very cool. But uh, uh, actually, uh, the lower the period, the, the higher will be the accuracy. So LTV stands for lifetime value. Lifetime means the whole period that the customer is with us be before he or she churns. Uh, and typically we don't know this, so it's going to be somewhere in infinity. So uh, a heuristic will be to replace it with, not with a lifetime, but with, with some high, uh, with some long period, like three months. So uh, if we make a prediction uh, uh, for the sum uh, that our customer is actually going to pay in three months, let's call it uh, LTV uh, 90. It's not actually a lifetime, but it's some proxy for how much th this guy is going to, to bring uh, to our company. So we keep track of payments in these uh, first seven days before the installation and we'll predict, um, actually I'll demonstrate predicting for 30 days. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, and our metric will be uh, not MSE here. So we're not going to predict uh, each customer's payment individually, 
uh, the metric will be a bit more reasonable from a business perspective. Uh, we'll have uh, the sum of all our predictions. So let's say we've got a thousand clients and we, we are going to sum up all the predictions for them and compare it with uh, the re real value. How much? So in, if we are at this point, we waited for seven days after the installation, uh, we, we make a prediction and uh, you know, in this 22, maybe 23 days, we'll know the actual value and we can calculate our metric. Uh, so you see there is some time difference between uh, our model prediction and actually assessing quality. Okay, so our metric will be, let's call it just an error. We'll sum up all predictions. Let predi prediction be, be noted with uh, P and uh, we'll divide it by uh, the sum of uh, real LTV uh, so our target, which we know. So the closer they, these are, the better. Uh, we can subs uh, subtract just one, uh, so the error will be zero if these uh, perfectly match. So you see, if this error is uh, positive, then we are overestimating, so the prediction is higher than the actual sum. Uh, if it's negative, then we are underestimating, and tr keeping track of the sign of this metric, we'll, we'll know whether our prediction is too high or too low. And zero will be optimal here. Okay, and we've got this time index in our data set and uh, we need to perform cross-validation uh, much more seriously here. So you can't just uh, mix all of your data and make a prediction. Uh, the general rule for any validation in machine learning is that with your historic data, you need to uh, to stick to the very same scheme as you'll do for your uh, future data. Uh, what I mean here is that uh, if it's uh, T0, if it's today, uh, and we, we've got some data set, we are going to, of course, we are going to train our model only on the past. So I'll call this just past. Ah, sorry. Our training set. And uh, when I use the model, this model in production, of course, it will make some predictions for the data we'll see in future. And we definitely shall keep the very same scheme uh, when we do cross-validation. So our training set shall always be in past as compared to the validation set. <coughs> so uh, why not just uh, mixing all the instances or shuffling all the training data and uh, doing just train test, train test split. Uh, so suppose overall, if we draw a graph of uh, all the customer payments, suppose if uh, the argument here T is again uh, again days, and we uh, and we plot this sum of LTVs, uh, so just our revenue for every day. Uh, let's just draw some random graph. But maybe at some point we invest more money into marketing and uh, we, we see a spike here. So much more uh, revenue are, uh, at this point. And you see that uh, um, we, don't, we didn't expect this spike and actually our models won't work really nice. So if we uh, just mix all the observations uh, in this data set, I would say this uh, if these uh, green dots will go into training set and some blue dots will go for validation, then we'll be lying to ourselves. Yep, so I'll just depict that uh, this is validation and uh, green is going to be training part. Then you see we'll... Uh, <coughs> for these uh, blue dots in validation, we're going to, to make some prediction, but we, we see some points close by in our training set, these uh, green ones. And uh, so these obser observations are similar. And if we do prediction for these uh, blue dots, uh, the prediction is going to be pretty nice yeah, because uh, some nearby values are, uh, are very similar. So if we were to predict here for these dots, we'll, we'll have uh, a much better metric uh, than we'll actually have if we do correct cross-validation scheme. 
so uh, this shall not be done. So in, uh, in this case, we'll, we'll have two optimistic errors. So the model would say the error is 1%, but on your real data, you'll have, I would, I would say, 15 or 20, much more. Why this is the reason? Because we actually we took a look into the future. So we, here we used some future observations like these green dots to train our model and to make a prediction to the past. So this shall be avoided. So if you compare it with a correct scheme where we always split our training part uh, and uh, future data. So if I draw the very same graph, uh, then uh, with a correct scheme, we'll train our model with our past data and our validation uh, will be in future. Well, so our model will perform awfully in this case, but, but at least this will be realistic estimation. So and we'll be not lying to ourselves that the model performs so good. So actually, in this case, it will perform uh, badly. It's always the case when you've got some sudden change in your data distribution. So if you've got lots of cases like this in your training set, then you'll create, you can create some features to capture this behavior. But if uh, this is the, the only data that we have, uh, the, the, the conclusion will be that uh, actually we can't predict uh, these prices if we have such a such a sudden spike but at least our model won't be confusing us <clears throat> okay so one point is that uh, you've got more realistic uh, me measures so you don't get too optimistic errors and uh, another point is that uh, with such a scheme as, uh, as is drawn above uh, we we actually using future data. So actually we are not able to do so in production. Yeah? So if we, if we keep to this scheme, so we, we've built some model on our training data and tomorrow new data will arrive and we need to, to make some prediction. Uh, so we, we can't extract any features from future data. So this scheme is, not, is incorrect. It's a uh, pretty subtle point, a subtle arg argument. So the, the very same goes for features. You can't, uh, you shall not build features that uh, use future data because you won't be able to build such, such features uh, when you'll, you'll actually have to deploy your model. <clears throat> yeah, so actually if you want to cheat and show that you've developed some model that, that is much better than all competitors, you would just shuffle all your data if you've got such a time trend in your data set. You'll shuffle all, all your data and uh, claim that your model performs really very, very nice. Uh, but actually, if you do cross-validation correctly, then uh, maybe figures will be misleading. <clears throat> okay, so actually, if we've got some uh, one-year uh, history of our payments, we would do cross-validation here, and it will look like, the, like that. So again, our time axis. And we'll, uh, let's say we are taking one month uh, long data to our training set, and we're going to build, actually, to, to feed the model with only one month history. Uh, so we'll start with, uh, actually, the first date in our training set, and we'll, we'll take one month. I would say uh, this is month zero, then month one, and this will be our first training set. And then you see we've got uh, uh, such a lag that we need 30 days more to actually calculate uh, the target. So for, for these observations, uh, we, we kept track of uh, se seven or eight days of payments. And then we are making a prediction for another month or 30 days. And we need these 30 days actually to calculate uh, the target. So we, we skip this one month. So uh, we need these observations to calculate targets for, for these dates. And we'll have our validation set definitely in future as compared to this one. And again, for the last observations in our validation set, we also need one month to calculate targets for them. So this will be validation. Uh, 
And again, it will be not correct to, to do so, to, to, to take training set from here and validation set uh, close by. So it's a uh, much, it's, it, it's really indeed a subtle argument, uh, but here, you know, for calculating target for this train object, you take a look into the future. And if you take a validation set again from uh, the very same, uh, well, if you use the very same uh, observations to calculate your train targets and to keep track of your validation set, then it's no good. Again, if you've got some sudden change in your distribution, uh, you'll have two optimistic errors. Okay, so this is one step of our validation. Yeah, so the, this one shall be crossed. Okay, so this is one step of the validation process, and then we just shift one month. So the second, the second iteration will be leaving the first one, and then moving one month uh, forward. So now it's going to be train, and somewhere here, validation. So this has uh, much to do with time series. So in time series, you you shall really track uh, cross validation in a similar way. But actually, our data set is not time series, but it has a time index in it, and uh, it it uh, poses some restrictions on a validation scheme that we adhere to. <coughs> okay. So any questions so far about the task? Okay, so the data that we'll have here uh, will be uh, pretty uh, scarce, so only payment features. <coughs> One moment. Okay, so what we have here, some data set it, uh, with a one year history of payments. And uh, uh, it's collected for lots of applications. So we've got an ID of an application. Uh, so really lots of them and payments can behave uh, different in, in different uh, applications. So we'll build, build special, uh, separate models for each of applications. And we've got uh, this DT is uh, the date of an installation and uh, payment on the first day after installation on the second and so on on the eighth and with that we are going to predict uh, for now uh, let's take this one uh, all the payments in in 30 days so this is going to be a linear model uh, we are actually predicting payments with the very same payments but in another period So if we take a look at this, uh, this will be uh, just some IDs. Uh, okay, I'm not actually commenting this. Some ID profile is actually identifying uh, the uh, particular customer here. Uh, GA ID is uh, Google advertising ID, then iPhones, Androids, and so on. So these are mobile applications. But let's take a look at payments. So. Here we, ha we have uh, installation date, so this one is somewhere in February, and uh, the first guy actually did didn't pay uh, anything on the installation date. Uh, I think LTV1 here is a payment on an installation day. Well, so you, you install an application, you, maybe it's a game and you play and you get used to it. Okay, so maybe the guy was getting used to the application for three days and then suddenly he started paying. and. Uh, you see, uh, this guy paid on the fourth day and on the eighth day. So these these features are cumulative. So uh, if he paid something on the uh, fourth day, and the the very same value on the fifth day will mean that he actually didn't pay for on on the fifth day. So features are cumulative here. Okay, so he actually paid something during this uh, period of eight days. And, uh, and then he paid nothing. Maybe he churned, and so on the 
30th day, this target that we're going to predict is the very same as, as at the 8th day. The second guy didn't pay anything within 30 days, but paid something uh, on the 60th day, uh, the same for the next one, uh, and so on. So we, we can actually uh, keep track of how uh, people behave in this application, what, what are their pay payment uh, patterns, actually. Okay, let's do something with this uh, data set. So we've got, uh, we've got applications. So ID app will stand for a different application. And uh, yeah, we can try to build uh, one model for all of applications, but it, it's not going to work. So typically in different products, you build different models. And here uh, mobile games uh, are, can differ completely. So uh, customer behavior there can, can be completely different. You can have sub subscriptions where customers pay only monthly, but you can have really addictive games where they spend m millions and billions. No, actually not, well, of course not billions, but millions. Uh, I would say in Euro, it will, somebody would pay hundreds, thousands uh, Euro during lifetime. Uh, well, so it's actually, the task is to, to find such guys. Um, yeah. Okay, let's take a look at uh, ID apps. We, we have some applications with uh, lots of observations. So here in this data set, each row is actually an observation, uh, one, one customer. And uh, the data set is quite big, uh, 3 million uh, observations. And uh, you see one third uh, of all of the customers are from a single application. Uh, so we can take a look uh, take a look at this one. So let's uh, select uh, maybe the biggest application and uh, build the first model. So we'll actually select some features uh, which we are going to use for prediction. So these features will be what they're called here is uh, LTV day uh, something. And we'll, we'll use uh, uh, these eight features to, to make a prediction. So how do I select all of these? Well, I can actually copy paste this, uh, but a typical thing to do will be to add stri and i iterates from one to eight. So this will be the features. And to, uh, for our training set, for actually the first training set, uh, let's call x train, uh, we'll uh, take our data frame uh, select this uh, biggest application and uh, select these features. So Xtrain will be df uh, lock. Uh, we'll, we'll take this application, um, this one, 5620, and take a look at these features that we selected, only payments. You see again pandas. So we started our le uh, our course, the, the whole course with pandas, and actually it's uh, used here and there in, in real projects. And here right now I'm using pandas, as you see. Okay, so this will be our matrix uh, X, uh, and so targets Y train uh, will be okay. The very same thing, but we are going to predict uh, LTV day thirty. Day 30. Sorry, X train. Okay, and so we, we have uh, a bit more than 1 million observations here and uh, 8 features, and Y is going to be uh, a vector. <coughs> okay, let's just do one train test split, but uh, you see we've got this. Uh, DT here, uh, date of installation, and it's uh, really very Im important to to, uh, to split your data based on on, on this uh, uh, on this timestamp. Yep, what I, what I explained about the validation scheme. So we'll uh, keep our validation set uh, really uh, completely in future uh, compared to the training set. 
Okay, so maybe it's not nice that I skipped uh, this DT feature here. I'll add it again. So we'll need to split based on this feature. Okay, so here I have payments and this uh, date of installation. I can take a look at uh, values of uh, dates of installation, maybe just a range, so minimum, minimum and maximum. Okay, so it's from uh, 2017, somewhere in July, uh, one year till, till June uh, 2018. Okay, so uh, for now I'm going just to make a, a train test split, but with respect to, to dates. Uh, so, <clears throat> okay, I'll just illustrate we are going to do only this split. Uh, so, in our case, okay, in our case, this is uh, somewhere in uh, July <coughs> to, uh, seven, 2017. And the end of our data, actually, that we can use for validation is uh, June 2018. Okay, and I'll, uh, I'll split the data somewhere here. Uh, for simplicity, let's pick uh, the 1st of January here as a splitting point. And I'll, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just take into account this uh, period that we don't use for validation. It's for calculating uh, actually uh, the target. And so our validation will be everything after January. <coughs> okay, let's clarify this a bit. <coughs> so we'll perform just a single train test split. Uh, so here will be uh, January the 1st. And we've got, we've got data till uh, June, and here is July, uh, July 17. <coughs> okay, so this is the latest data that we've got. We need one month actually to calculate targets for the validation set, right? <coughs> so uh, for, for these guys, we need one month to calculate uh, uh, LTV of the 30th date, so our target. And the same for training sets, so we'll uh, we'll use this period in December 17 to calculate targets for everything in train. So we'll take the training set till uh, the end of November 17. Uh, actually November 30, 2017. Okay, actually you get the idea, yep. So the validation scheme. And this is going to be something in May uh, 2018. Yeah, actually end of May, actually depends. Uh, I think it won't be end of May, but somewhere in the middle of May. <coughs> Okay, so actually we'll keep track of uh, this scheme uh, when, when performing cross-validation. Yep, so we'll, uh, we'll start with this one and then we'll move our uh, windows to, to actually get several uh, estimations. <coughs> For now, let's take a look at uh, this single split that we, we've got. So X, uh, if, if we sort the data what actually we shall do, uh, sort the data uh, by DT, installation time. Uh, let it be ascending order. So these are our first observations. <coughs> Sorry, sort values. Okay, so first installations are somewhere in July 2017. 
and uh, the very same but tail will be first installations uh, in uh, yeah in June 2018. But for all of these observations, we actually have uh, the target in this data set. So here we'll just uh, perform a single split. Uh, <clears throat> so in our in our case, we we already have these targets for for all of our. So actually, in our case, uh, the picture is not exactly these. So uh, our latest observations, and we, we've got already targets for them, this y vector. So actually, in our case, this is uh, June, the latest day that we see here, June uh, 6. OK, but still, we, uh, we need to leave this empty period for calculating targets in a training set. OK, so. I'll just simply say that uh, everything be, uh, before December 17 will go for training set and everything after January will go into validation set. So let's do that for now. <coughs> okay, so it will have X train uh, part We'll get it from X train. Uh, by putting some conditions on DT, so it shall be lower than uh, December 18, uh, the first of December 2017. Uh, and uh, actually that's all. And we'll keep all these features, our payments that we've got. And for validation set, <coughs> yeah, well, uh, actually, uh, it will be the same, but higher than uh, the date shall be bigger than the 1st of January. OK, and the same for targets. We'll have Y train part. Okay. Yep, and we'll have targets in a validation set. Okay. Correct. Y train. Yeah. Okay. Nice thing to to actually check is whether of. Uh, our payments uh, distributed somewhat uh, uh, equally during this time period. What if we don't have any observations at all, uh, or maybe too few of them in the training part? Let's just for now compare the, the shape of these data sets. Uh, so we'll have something in this training part and in the validation part. OK, so they're almost equal. Yeah, val validation set is. Uh, a bit uh, smaller in terms of data, so uh, several only five months here in the validation set, uh, a bit more in training set, uh, I would say, but uh, the number of observations you see in the validation set is a bit higher. <coughs> okay, let's so already train something. So from sklearn uh, linear model, we'll import rich regression. So we don't have uh, many features here, uh, only eight of them. So we're not going to do uh, feature selection. So we can we can use rich regression here. <coughs> we'll create an instance of uh, this object, uh, rich. <coughs> so we see this uh, regularization parameter. You can scale your features. You can either either fit intercept this W zero or not. Uh, well, other arguments are not that important, only maybe for reproducibility, fixing some random state. <coughs> okay. And I'm fitting this to our training part. Let's measure how much time it takes. 
so you see half, half a million objects here, uh, half a million observations, but the model is really very, very quick. Also because uh, the dimensions are very low, only on the eight features, so you can see, you, you can train it very, very fast. Okay, so, and we'll have some rich uh, validation prediction. Yeah, and now let's calculate uh, our metric. We can uh, write a special function for that. So actually we're not pretty much interested in MSE or something like that. Uh, so it's not very interesting uh, whether a particular customer is going to pay exactly, you know, 17 boxes or 18. Uh, and, but mean squared error measures these uh, differences between prediction and uh, uh, real observation. So, okay, so we're interested in that only for all our validation set. So all, for all the bulk of our uh, customers. So in our case, we'll calculate this error uh, that we'll keep track of. Uh, so we'll, we'll sum all our predictions as I described. So just sum, uh, divide over the answers, the actual LTVs, for all of these guys, and we'll subtract one. And you see it's pretty good. So if I multiply it by 100, I'll get percentages. Uh, so let's print it like that. Okay, these are percent. Okay. Oh, the percentage. Oh, one moment. <coughs> What's wrong here? Okay. I'll use formatting here. <laughs> Format. Okay, so you see it's uh, only 1% error, I would say. We're underestimating the prediction just a bit. But we, we've taken the biggest application, so really lots and lots of uh, observations here. And uh, the error is uh, actually so low. So for such a huge data set, if you keep track of uh, one week of payments, you can predict uh, the very same payment in 22 days more, so in a month from installation, so you know, pretty well actually. But for now, I've uh, I've taken the uh, largest application with lots of observations, uh, but we'll do the same, but uh, but for all of applications. For now, let's uh, actually I, I skipped some preliminary data analysis. Uh, I shouldn't have done so. Uh, let's take a look at uh, at the data. What can be actually interesting here? Uh, so first of all, if you try, uh, it, it, it's real data, so you've got very, very skewed uh, data set in terms of payments. So if you try something simple like uh, taking our target, uh, this LTV uh, day, day 30, if you try to, be to build a histogram, nothing good, yep, you'll, well, it, it will look ugly uh, because you've got a really very, very skewed data set. So actually the first thing to analyze would be uh, <coughs> how much, how many people actually paid something. Yep. So uh, if we take a look at, uh, let's return to all of our data set and uh, take the target one month payment. What's the share of uh, guys who did, didn't pay anything. Well, so it can, again, vary from application to application, but uh, on average for this data set, uh, we'll see that, well, if mean is 0, 20, 28, yeah, so it, this is the percentage, the percentage of uh, actually customers who paid just anything. 
and 72% of uh, these guy, guys didn't pay anything at all. We took a particular application. Let's take a look uh, at, at this one. X train, uh, if we just calculate mean, um, sorry, uh, this will be an average payment, yep. Yeah. Uh, that's what I wanted to calculate. Yeah, here the percentage of uh, those who pay is 31, but it can differ from application to application. We can analyze it. Um, okay, again, a simple pandas task, how you can quickly build it for every application. Uh, maybe we need to group by. Uh, we, we are grouping with uh, application. And we'll take a look at uh, uh, LTV day 30. So do we have something like non-zero for pandas? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, no. OK. It's, I don't like actually thinking while lecturing. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's challenging, uh, so I'll do it uh, like that. Yeah, so with a four cycle, uh, four ID app um, for ID app and uh, sub data frame in this group by. Uh, I'm just actually calculating the, the very same thing. OK, so but here we've got a sub date frame. We can print an actual application. Uh, it's not meaningful in our case, uh, but we can uh, also print the size of the data set. Sub data frame shape. Um, okay, sub data frame. Okay. What again did I do wrong? Uh, so. I'm printing shape. Um, Okay, Bra brackets again. <laughs> well, okay, so uh, these are percentages of... Uh, <clears throat> did I interpret it right? Yep, so if I'm calculating the percentage of uh, these values being equal to zero, uh, so this 45 is going to be the percentage of Okay, of those who didn't pay anything, yep. So fi 55 uh, of percent of customers just uh, pay an anything at all. Okay, you see it, it differs from application to application and it's one of the reasons that we will train a separate model for every application. So the <coughs> behavior of customers differs very much even in terms of the percentage of those who pay anything at all. OK, so if you try to, to build such a histogram, uh, it's not going to work at all. Uh, you might uh, build a, you might apply logarithm here if I import uh, NumPy. We can calculate logarithm of this thing. And uh, in NumPy, it's log 1p, it's uh, the function uh, logarithm 1 plus x, uh, just in order to not take an, a logarithm of a negative value. Uh, OK, this will tell us something. Yeah, so here's the logarithm of payments. Uh, so these are actually zeros. So zeros are non-pairs. And uh, this is a logarithmic scale. And it tells us that uh, some some people tend to, to pay a little, some people tend to, to pay more, and there will be a long tail 
maybe in this logarithmic scale it's not that long, but uh, we'll have a tail of those who pay really a lot. Actually, for a regression task, it's, the data is actually very, very challenging for a typical regression because it's such a huge skew in the target variable. Uh, so you see what we started with, just building a histogram for this thing. And uh, you see, it's not in informative at all, only that some values are really very, very high. So actually trying to catch these, uh, we would call them, uh, well, okay, maybe it's a jargon, whales. So really these big, big guys, they bring a lot of, uh, so yeah, we call them whales. Uh, so we can really earn a lot on them. But un unfortunately, we can't actually predict these guys. So typically they, s uh, they spend a lot of money, uh, but uh, you've got only several observations like that and uh, it's very challenging. Yeah, okay, it's possible to some extent to predict these guys, to identify them, but uh, as a purely regression task, it's, um, it's awful uh, because it introduces a very, very huge skew in the data set. <clears throat> we can get some information by building a scatter plot. Uh, if we take, okay, let's take a selected data set. Uh, let's take uh, the eight day payment and uh, our target, which is 30 day payment uh, Y train. And if we build a scatter plot, we'll see that uh, some customers be behave differently. Well, one million observations, maybe it will take some time. Yeah, so here it is. These are outliers. Uh, and uh, this main diagonal would say that the customer pays exactly the same amount in eight days and 30 days. So actually that means that uh, he paid something in the beginning, he or she paid something in the beginning and then churned, just disappeared. On the contrary, we have some guys who didn't pay at all in eight days, uh, but then at some point they started paying uh, later. And something in between. Okay, now uh, I'm going to, to show you some cross validation uh, according to the scheme that we discussed. Well, it's uh, so, some a bit of code, so I'm going, not going to, to run it right now. I'll show it uh, already here. Yeah, I'll share this notebook as well. So some more graphs here. Uh, okay, yeah, it's a nice thing to do is to build a histogram for uh, our predictions and real observations. And we can see that yeah, with such a skew, it's a, a challenging task. So if you take a look at uh, the model predictions, uh, it is not that perfect. But uh, if we sum up, as, as we've seen for those applications where, where we have a lot of data, you can easily predict uh, pretty well. <clears throat> okay. What I'm going to do right now to actually show you is this uh, cross-validation. So we'll, we'll start with uh, the first day in our data set. Uh, then the end of the training part will be in two months. Uh, and then we'll skip some period and uh, the beginning of the test day will be in three months. And the end of the test day, uh, test data set will be in four months. So it corresponds to this scheme. So, uh, what I've depicted here, that uh, this is T0, the first day in our data set, then plus 60 days. So this, uh, sorry. Okay, so this forms the data set, uh, the training part of the data set. And then uh, from plus 90 days till plus 120, this is going to be a, a test part. Or maybe, a, okay, in code it, it said uh, test part, but actually it's a validation part. 
So this is going to be uh, the first model evaluation. And then we, uh, we, we change. <coughs> OK, we, we move everything uh, one, one month. Yeah, so this is moment in 30 days and nine, 90. So now this is going to be the train set. And by the same token, the validation part moves uh, one month to the right. And for each of these periods, we've got lots of uh, applications. And so we'll train the model uh, separately for all, all of the application. So actually, this is implemented here. We'll keep track of errors uh, by each application. Uh, we'll start with these uh, dates and then until the end. So we've got some final date uh, in our date set this June, uh, some middle of June. So we'll have a while loop. We'll select the appropriate part of the uh, data set. Then we'll group by by application and uh, select uh, the corresponding features. So again, here we, we, we select the uh, necessary application and take a look at these features, these uh, eight ones that we use for prediction. Then our target is, again, LTV 30. Uh, some more details. Uh, we're going to restrict the data set to at least 1,000 uh, points, so this minimal train size. Unless it's not really reasonable to train a model, if you've got if you've got too few observations, uh, some well we've seen an uh, application with millions of, of observations. But if you see uh, some application is really too small, and for a certain date you've got only twenty observations or so, it's not really reasonable to train a model. So we'll require at least one thousand actually payments. Uh, no, it's one thousand customers to actually train a model. And uh, OK, so we'll train a model if, uh, if we have more than 1,000 observations in a training set and at least some, something in a validation set. Uh, OK, so here we are fitting the model. We are calculating this metric. And then we only fill in this dictionary. Yep, so if we have this application in dictionary, then if it's not empty, we will append. OK, and so we, uh, the crucial part that then we'll move all our dates to uh, 30, 30 days in future. Yeah? So this step size is 30. So we started with some uh, days and we'll, we, we have a while loop. Yep. Uh, and then we'll increase every date uh, with, in, uh, with 30 days. Right? And then we'll do all this again. OK, and then uh, if you calculate all these errors for all applications, so uh, I've chosen top five applications in the number of payments. Again, these five, six, two, zero. Oh. So you see, uh, now we can analyze how model error behaves with respect to time. Um, can I make it bigger? Okay, so pretty reasonable. So for these top five applications, uh, error is never much worse than 15%. So here, positive values are overestimations, uh, negative are underestimation. And here, well, we see that uh, in the beginning, uh, we models, uh, so model errors were much higher for some applications, maybe because we didn't have much data for, for these ones. So this uh, red, red uh, curve is some application. Uh, violet is another one. Okay, for, for these ones, I think we, we, we didn't have enough data in the beginning. But then, uh, actually, uh, accuracy improved. I would better have done this picture with uh, time axis, yeah, not just indices of validation splits, but with, with times. But you can keep, keep track of such events when, well, in some period, occasionally, the model behaves much worse, so almost 10% of the error. Uh, yeah, so much more analysis is, uh, can be done here. But overall, for these top five applications, it's uh, pretty reasonable. So mostly, the error is somewhere in, in between minus 10% and, and plus 10%. So there's, again, a question uh, how this maps to the business side of the question. But actually, this metric is pretty nice. So if you can estimate uh, the percentage of 
uh, how, how well you can predict the total sum of your payments for a certain period. Then, so it's going to be some proxy metric for the final ones for actually being able to nicely predict LTV. Uh, well, so the business side of this uh, task is of course a bit different. So there is a trade-off between uh, attracting a customer and actually getting value from, from this one. So maybe a real business metric will be something different, uh, some, some difference between uh, expected uh, revenue from a customer and uh, acquisition cost, right? But this, uh, what we calculate here, this error is a very nice proxy for such a metric. Well, if you analyze it further for, for some smaller applications, uh, you see, uh, for some of them, it might be not that good. Uh, again, some large errors for some application where we didn't have much data in the beginning, then something reasonable. Then for some of the applications, the error you see is pretty high. But I would say business requirements in this task were uh, that the errors in, in this corridor, in uh, the errors between minus 25% and plus 25%, these were really reasonable in, in this task. So. If the error is 25%, then it, it's okay. But still, for some applications, you might see that you, you know some outliers, some periods when the model is not very good. There might be lots of reasons for that. You can uh, make some promotions, and suddenly uh, you've got much more, much more data, much more payments, and your model will not behave that well. Uh, this, this one, you see, it only started collecting data is somewhere maybe in in the beginning of uh, this year. And then while collecting data, it improved its predictions and so on and so on. Uh, of course, less data you have, uh, the higher will be errors. But again, for some applications from 10th to 15th, still it's reasonable in the range of th uh, minus 30% to plus 30. Okay, so that's, that's actually uh, the idea. Well, so uh, here we just used only real payments uh, during one week after installing the application, but still you can have much more, much more data. So this is really a very simple model just to demonstrate, but you can know lots of things about customers. Uh, you can keep track of different uh, events occurring in the game. So uh, it's not only about payments here, yeah, but uh, if somebody achieved some really high level, maybe we can uh, hypothesize that uh, the guy is going also to pay because he is deeply involved uh, in the application. And you can actually keep track of lots and lots of uh, uh, features specific for uh, each application. And by the way, we discussed uh, that linear models are nice in such cases where you've got really lots and lots of features. And uh, here, these events are really uh, overwhelming. So there are many, many events like that in, in the game. So you can keep track of all logins, logouts, every, you know, every click, every tap. And uh, you've, you've got really lots and lots of features. And linear models are very nice in this uh, sparse format with many, many features. Okay, so that's what I wanted to discuss uh, in this lecture. So uh, next one will be about unsupervised learning. So the setting will be completely different. We will won't have labeled data, uh, but we'll discuss all the ways we can actually find some structure just in, in your data without labels. Thanks.